Hello, and welcome to Why Are We Talking About Rabbits? That's this podcast aimed at folks who feel a certain sense of dislocation in 2020, actually 21. On this pod, we talk about heavy things lightly, and today we move over and visit Eden. That's right. We revisit Eden on a podcast called Eden Revisited. Meet Austin and Nick today who run a podcast. They invited us over. In particular, they invited me over to talk about a new book that I've just published called Three Souls. Take a listen because it's kind of cool. These cats are trying to figure out culture and the cultivation in the, of the interior life. And in many ways, that's what we're trying to do in First Things Foundation. And this novel speaks to this idea. But guess what we talk about? Education. Revolution. Yeah, protesting. Trying to blow things up, because that's in the book. We talk about love, and we talk about pain and suffering, all the things found in this book. And in the end, there's even a little chat about what it means to be fully human. Join us on Watar as we join Eden and revisit a podcast that we're very thankful to be invited to. Hello and welcome back to Eden Revisited. This is one of your hosts, Nick Paternos, and I'm joined by Austin Kleiss. And you know what? we got another guest episode today. So we have another gentleman sitting down with us, joining us from... South Carolina is John Hears. John is the founder and director of the First Things Foundation, which is a nonprofit that sends field workers to some of the toughest parts of the world, like Sierra Leone, Guatemala, Appalachia. Austin, you worked with John at the First Things Foundation in uh, yes. Sierra Leone, and my brother still works for FTF. And we'll get more into the organization later, but John is also the host of a podcast called Why Are We Talking About Rabbits, longtime educator. But really why we're having John on the podcast today is because he just published his first book called Three Souls. And it's got some really cool themes that resonate a lot with the ideas what we talk about on this podcast. So John, thanks so much for joining us. And can you believe it? You got a book published. (laughs) Nick. Nick, thanks for having me. This is fantastic. Uh, I did. This thing has been a long time in the making. Uh, it's a joy seeing it show up in my box over there. Well, in a box and, um, uh, so many people helped with this. It's incredible. And your brother was one of them instrumental in helping. So I feel just blessed to be here and to, uh, talk about this book, something that really I started writing in 1999. Gosh, it's been a labor of love. Yeah. Well, it got done fast. And then what happened was. Marketing. Right. I, fast isn't the right word. Uh, I went and lived in Haiti and I worked, uh, I was an Orthodox Christian missionary. That word is packed. I'd love to unpack that if you guys want to. But uh, I took my family, including my, I had a little five month old at the time, plus the, a five year old and a 12 year old. And I'll tell you, I wrote a lot there um, and that really shaped a lot of this book. But uh, when I got back, I just took two whole summers and finished it. Mm -hmm. And then the other part of life kicked in, in in marketing and thinking about it and who am I going to sell it to? And and, uh, I didn't have anybody helping me and I I was finished. (laughs) But it wasn't finished. It had to get finished. But it's it's done. Do you guys have that in life? Yeah, it's done now and it's fantastic and I'm thankful for it. By fantastic, here's what I mean is, uh, you know, things uh, that take – flesh and in this case the flesh is papyrus paper and when something is incarnate and becomes real in your hand or you know in your bed your wife or it's fundamentally a different experience right it's not the same thing and uh it's the old gnostic idea right that all the information if you get it all right it's well you're living the perfect life but it's not real that's not true because ideas in that sense aren't real until they're manifest So it's manifest, man, and uh, you guys are helping me talk about it, which is great. Well, let's delve into some of those ideas. So for our listeners, the book is set in Harlem, New York, and it tells Mm -hmm. the stories of 
basically three individuals whose lives converge in this kind of, as you describe it, an ancient uptown love triangle. But it's still set, what, in the, in the 90s, you'd say, late 90s? Mm-hmm, 90s. Mm-hmm. And they're mm-hmm. caught in this web of passion and revolution and conversion. I mean, you mentioned you went to Haiti. You've done some missionary work. You've been in many different parts of the world. But, I mean, fundamentally, what inspired this book, if it boils down to it, you know, what was going on in your life where you're like, I've got to tell this yeah. story? Yeah, that's and you know that's what happens. Uh, I'd like I think I'm a writer now, and I think that's what happens to writers. So fundamentally, at its core, and by the way, we're not going to do spoilers, right? Because I want people to read this. Yeah, but, of course. Uh, uh, and by the way, what I'm going to tell you right now, as per inspiration, is not really what happens in the book. Of course, there's all these modalities and realities, and s- the symbolism, right, is both happening and not happening. So, yes, this is the story I'm going to tell you. But really, it, what it boils down to is fundamentally a story about my wife who for many years wasn't and wouldn't be my wife. <laughs> uh, she and I met. Uh, I She met when I uh, was on a date with one of her friends. Uh, the whole thing gets sideways. I fall much faster in love, for, th- and she's not really interested. But eventually what happens is, is I leave the country to go do overseas work. She remains in the country, and fundamentally her life starts to bend and change. And she becomes uh, uh, baptized in the Orthodox tradition, Orthodox Christian tradition, while I'm away. And I'm in the Georgian Republic, and I decide to go back home after my contract is over and buy a ring. Now, you got to realize she was not dating me. Wait, 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 wait. You, you, bought a, you bought a ring for her, and yes, you, you were not yes. dating? We were not dating. Now, Jeez. when you hear dating, yeah, when you hear dating here, you have to realize... We really liked each other, but uh, it's the 90s, guys. Uh, I am no saint and no monk. So it was like a compartmentalization of life where we would come together and she would even go to church from time to time before I left to go for a year in the Georgian Republic. But she had her own romantic life and I had mine, but I was always trying to shed mine for hers and she would not join the party. And so... She's a black woman from Harlem who basically told me right when she met me, I'm not marrying a white guy. Isn't that interesting? Wow. That was part of her hurdle. But the other hurdle that she had was she felt I was very immature, Hmm. which I was. And Georgia toughened me up. But long story short, the inspiration comes from this event is in uh, coming back and asking her. Well, what happened was is we're walking on 66th Street right alongside a Lincoln Center. And she tells me that her boyfriend at the time, who was an up and down character, had bought her a ring and was going to ask her to marry her. Mm. And I said, this is nonsense because I had the ring, Nick. Yeah, we got got some rivalry action going. Yes. And I just blurted out, this is nonsense. (laughs) I'm going to marry you. And she just started crying. So what what happens next? What happens next is a series of very violent events that involve her boyfriend, including uh, his suicide. And that happens over the course of a couple months. And I won't get into the whole story, but what you start to see, both in my life and in the life of my wife and then our kids-to-be, a series of revelations about what I really am. And I really am a baby. I really am a child. And I really do not understand suffering. I've seen it and experienced it overseas at this point in my life, but I really am a baby. And she really is a warrior, but she really is messed up. And, and, and through all of that and through the birthing of our family, both, both I, but I just mean babies, of course, but I also mean like through the maturation of our relationship, um, there's, uh, it's beauty is born out of it. So it's really a story about redemption. Now, in the book, there is no my wife per se, but the themes of that rebirth are everywhere. So it seems like despite these differences that you and your wife had, you, you made it, you're together, you're still married today, and you have beautiful children, but also you guys operate probably on different planes, so to speak. The yeah. Your composition is different, and the composition of your characters are also very different. And I've heard you Mm -hmm, describe mm -hmm. this before. There's like three Mm -hmm. different modalities of the human person. You've got head people, you've got gut people, and you have heart people. You know, why are these different parts so important in your writing and for us to understand? Right. 
I think if you guys think of it too, you in Austin and your, if you, if everyone in your audience sits and stops for a second, there's this really strong implication in all of our lives that somebody was already something. That there seems to be some way that I was already formed. Uh, you know, he's artistic or he's very mathematical or something. And so w- w- all the ancients, and I really like history, and a lot of history goes into this book in terms of philosophical history, like ideas about about who the human person is. I try to weave them into the book. And, and I think one of the, uh, the most illustrative ideas is the platonic notion of of the three chariots, uh, the three horses in a chariot race. Mm. And, you know, there's reason – and there's the belly or the passions, and then there's the heart. And so in my tradition, the tradition that I use to try to get through through any given day, uh, the, the Orthodox Christian tradition, the belly is the place where resides the passion. Now, what's really important is I have characters in the book that try to uh, they exemplify this, but also there are characters in the book, uh, Mickens one, who wants to be this. Hmm. He goes from he's a head guy, right? He's a rationalist. He fundamentally knows that the world works. It works on time, and it's only a matter of us becoming aware of the timing, becoming aware of the math, becoming aware of the rules. But he, throughout he, in the book, he starts to shift and change because of the experiences of the revolution that he's taking part in, and then he wants the passion. And so one of the things to try to address in the book is how does one acquire the thing that you were given less of? How does one acquire, for example, Nick, I don't know if this is resonating with you, but I don't know what kind of guy you are. I have a feeling. I have a feeling about what kind of guy you are. Well, what kind of guy would you say you are? Well, I want to hear you first. Who who am I? And I'm curious what you think Austin is too, because this is an interesting exercise. Okay, good. We know each other actually pretty well, all of us. So- Let's just finish. The head, right, in the Platonic tradition, which is really in some ways the Neoplatonic tradition gets shifted in some ways and consumed in, in, within Christianity, I think both in the Christian West and the Christian East. So the head, right, is this place where resides the reason. Now, we can take issue with this and talk about it. It's just fun. Mm-hmm. But in the belly resides the passions. And now try not to hear that as negative, I think in a lot of Christianity, especially puritanical forms, there's a, there's a negativity about the passions. But all passions are, 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 are neutral until they're taken up. So it's, it's not just like sexual passions. Right, exactly. So, so here, this one, here's one, F- hunger. I mean, that's a passion, right? right. Food. Uh, sex, of course, is an obvious one. But he- here's one, here's one, uh, play recreation it's a type of joy that you can but you can also become overwhelmed by trying to pursue it right it can become something that gets out of whack Mm -hmm. any types of desire right Mm -hmm. any types of but but that's a and some people live in that space dostoevsky writes about that a lot right in brothers karamazov all of his books but in brothers karamazov the father is just lost in that space Mm -hmm. right if you guys know that book or even dimitri his son is trying to work out of that space but then there's the heart and so in plato's story about how people are the heart and the head often get confused in western tradition and so the, the Greeks, I think, would argue that the front horse, the lead horse is the noose, which is would be the spiritual reason or would be the heart. Now, today's modern person hears heart as the place of the feelings and the and the and the, and the romance, right? Right, all the all the sentimental mushy gushy stuff. Right. That stuff resides. I mean, I got daughters. For most folks growing up in America, that's where you find that stuff is in the heart. But in the book, what I'm trying to say is, is that place is actually reserved for something else. It's a combination of, of, of the passionate life and the rational life, but made right through this thing called the noose, which is a type of pathway or highway to God, essentially. Mm. So it's the heart that's, that some people live in. And that place, when lived in in a really beautiful way, that place is actually the communication pathway or the way by which we know the divine. Okay. And then that has to lead. And in Plato's 
you know, story of, of in Plato's anthropology, essentially, the lead horse is the reason. But I think, and I would argue that his reason is a little bit different than the reason we've come to know in the in the West, in our very scientific age, which is the reason of technica, the reason of the of, of the mind, the reason of math or technology. This is a type of reason for sure, but it's not the type I think that Plato or any of the early uh, Christians would want as the lead horse. Finally, my characters are trying to take this stuff on, and and they're both imbued with it on purpose as the writer. I, I try to imbue it, but they're also trying to shed some of it if i could jump in there john so you talk about the head you talk about the heart and then you talk about this thing called the noose i'm curious as the author when you are writing this coming back from time overseas with this sort of love angst (laughs) what was what was driving you at the moment of the conception of of this book i mean what was kind of the the leading force in your life of those three things and then and then maybe tie that back to the broader culture of where we're at. Right. So, I think without fail Austin an author shows up in the narratives of his characters and mine shows up probably most often with David. And what I was trying to do Austin was sort out my wife. So, you guys got to understand and you've met her. Uh She's a powerful character. She's an uptown girl in the truest sense. And, and that's what one reason I love New York, but I wasn't, you know, I had put on New York. I acquired New York uh, by going to grad school there right after college and then staying for 18 years. But now I'm married to a New Yorker, man. (laughs) Like I'm, uh, I'm now, you know, I'm in bed. I'm out of bed. I'm at the grocery store. I'm, and this woman is un- unrelenting. And uh, one of the things I was trying to figure out was, was I a wuss? What was I? And I was living down in the, the passionate regions most of my life. I wanted good feelings. And what happened was, is living with my wife, I could not live in good feelings. Now, that sounds terrible, like she's making me unhappy. But no, do not equate that. Because what was happening was, is the parts that I had relied on, like a pacifier, were being taken from me. Which is good, right? Because I was becoming a man. And as I became a man, I wanted to talk about it. And I wanted to imbue it in both a piece of art. I've always been whatever that is, artistic. And I wanted it to be told that it's okay to be unhappy in one sense, as long as what you're acquiring is a, is a deeper, more profound, and I would call even a more divine type of joy, type of happiness. And so I think I was really moved by that, Austin. But in a, it wasn't comfortable. I, I, I'll give you an idea. This could be either bad or good. This was happening to me. We were uh, on fire with our faith. And what would happen was, is we would read Vespers at night. Now, I was into it, right? I had my long beard, my ponytail. I was into it. She was into it. As I would read, I don't know if you guys know the order. You guys are good Catholics, so you know how it kind of works. But it's confusing. The Orthodox the Orthodox liturgy is not easy to – you've got different right, – then there's no one book for this stuff. There's like five on any given service. And I would get it wrong, but she would know I would get it wrong. And she would, like in front of the kids, go, that is not the Kentuckian for today. Re, re. I was My head was about to go poof, poof. Like I was about to lose it on a regular because I was being – challenged about the stuff that was in the head. And by the way, she'll tell you, and she's going to hear this, so this is Mm. terrifying. She'll tell you she was in her head. Like she always says, if I hadn't married you, I would have become a lawyer. I would have worked for a big corporate company and I would have been a, can I say the B word? She, I would be an awful person because she was in her head, which by the way, in our country, if you get up there right in your head and you're real, real strong and powerful and rational and move and work hard, you get successful. And that was what she was fighting against. And guess who was there to help her? Me with my bottom feeding self. You see, we were, we were helping each other. And that's really what happens with the book, Austin. And that's, I think, the profound motivation when I get back because I'm really writing as a married man at that point. So there's a shedding that's going on, John. You're, yeah. you're, you've said there's a stripping 
away of the self and both of you your wife or the yeah. head stripping away uh some of some of those aspects there you stripping away some of these passions and you're you're meeting somewhat in the middle here so would you say then that the noose or the heart is that the only way that you can operate in the fullness of what it means to be a human person so the head people and the passion people mm -hmm. the gut people need mm -hmm. to get to that heart place or they're not really living oh, their authentic selves Right, that implies some sort of one one authenticness or whatever the word is, one one authentic type of being. So I, I think a different way to say it is, and I know I, I get I like your question. What I might say is there are variations on reality. So I do think that reality would have us live as if in Eden. I see see. One of my characters, Rafaela, is always groping toward Eden. And um, I think this is what makes our, our podcast go together nicely with this book. And she's groping toward the ideal. And one of the things that, sh that happens to her is she's a, not a, a comfortable person to be with in the book as she gropes toward it. And so I do think that the integration of the head and the and the and the gut into the heart is the purpose of life. Yeah, I do think when someone says what's life for, it's to take all the various modalities of life and to slowly whittle the ones down that for whatever reason are too large and to eventually fold them all into the heart. And again, if you're hearing this and you're hearing heart and you're thinking Romantic place, special happy place. That's not really what the heart is, at least as not not per my my novel. The heart is really the place where clarity happens, where you can both see that you are off the track and that there is a track. And that clarity can only come usually through a variations on suffering. And again, that's what happens to Raphael in the book. There's variations on suffering that lead her closer and closer to true joy. I do think that all of us, all of us are called to move toward um, a type of shedding. Now, don't get me wrong. There's no shame in any of the shedding. You're very odd if suddenly I'm like, Nick, you're really rational. You're overusing your mind and I don't want to be your friend. That'd be, it's just, it's odd. It's an odd way to think of it as, sin or not sin, bad or good. It's just reality, you know? John, I think this is this is a really important point. You talk about, you know, when we're talking about the heart, just for our listeners and, and to really dive on into this point, because I know a lot of your characters, this is the struggle, right? Mm -hmm. Would you say that when you're living in that state, I don't even know what that what that word would be, but when, so, you're, when you're living in, yeah, when you're, when you're living in that state, are you contemplating maybe the truth? Like I get it as a sense of like, this is the place where you're contemplating the truth. And the, and the reason that they're suffering to some degree is because when the truth, capital T, doesn't align with your own life, mm -hmm. then there's a necessary mm -hmm. sort of shedding like you're talking mm -hmm. about to live more in alignment with that, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. to, to throw off the passions if they're in excess that are getting in the way of living in accordance in, in the way of the truth. I mean, is that... Yeah. Is that one way to look at it as the contemplation and then the following of the of the truth? For, for sure, for me, in Three Souls. The word is asceticism. And what you just described to me, I was hearing asceticism. And, and what it is, it, I, don't, I think it's an old-fashioned word, right? But I think what it is, is asceticism says, I'm going to become an athlete, which is actually the Greek word. I'm going to become an athlete of, right? acquiring truth. I'm just going to do this. And so I'm going to look clearly at who I am and then I don't really like what I see. But that's not where I stop. I stop with, and what do I do in order to become closer to what I'm meant to be? And then you got to get into what you're meant to be, which is a fascinating conversation. But yeah, so Austin, I do think that, again, athlete, ascetic is for everyone to become, and all of us, once we start in the path, start to acquire the pain that an athlete acquires. You know, weightlifting is breaking down muscles, right? Mm -hmm. And that's something for all of us to do in a spiritual sense. The problem is, is how. So one of the things I'm trying to do in the book, guys, 
is actually so, show someone go through it. Because what what I think a lot of us do, especially all in the podcast world, and by the way, I'm I'm new to it. I'm not trying to claim any moral high ground, but we just do ideas all day long because it's easy. I mean, what else are we going to do? I guess you could show me, I don't know, doing old world stuff. I don't know. In my podcast, that would be, but ideas are wonderful, but they have to be manifest. They have to become real. And what does it look like? <laughs> like that's what, So Raphael is actually doing it. And so at one point in the book, she, she takes in homeless people. It's nuts. I think it's nuts personally, because I can remember living as a New Yorker. I can, I can remember some of these cats and I based a lot of the characters that she works with on these people that I actually knew. And she just puts them in her front room and just sets up cots. And then she gets in trouble with the city and they're trying to like evict her. She's like, no, no, I'm just doing the thing that I'm supposed to do. But for everyone else, like David, who you know, her, the father of her child, for David, it looks like insanity. But for Raphael, it's just an athletic endeavor, a spiritually athletic endeavor. And she can't understand when everyone's yelling at her. Right. So Raphael is essentially trying to, we say on our podcast, to cultivate yes. her interior garden. She's trying to practice asceticism to make her, her spiritual yeah, self yeah. stronger in a sense. Now, there's another character in your book who does want to practice a transformation of self, but I think it's a lot different than the asceticism piece. One of your characters, Mitkin, instead of changing himself, what he wants to do is yeah. to change yeah. a system. So athletes, right? So his mentality would be like, I'm not going to work harder over the summer. I'm not going to lift weights. I just think that the <laughs> basketball hoop shouldn't be 10 yes. feet. It should be six Fick feet. the system, right? right? And, he, <laughs> and he wants to change that Love across that. the board. This character is also emblematic of some of our society today. It's really sexy to say that we're going to reform a school mm -hmm. system, which is what this guy wants to do. He wants mm -hmm. to, to revolutionize it. And uh, it's not an individual solution. He, it's, it's. We got to burn down mm. the central district office in New York mm. to, to, to undo all this. So, what is the difference here between mm. changing yourself versus changing a system? And then, I mean, you're an educator, also. What is the problem, perhaps, with education? So maybe we're taking a little bit of a different direction here. But sure, why not? The the book is meant to take take you down that road. It's just because it's what I knew. At the time, I was working in New York City in the Bronx, South Bronx High School. Uh, that's actually in the – that's the part of town. Where I, if Some of the older crew that might listen to your show, Fort Apache, the Bronx, that's that neighborhood. And I uh, worked at Martin Luther King High School, which was uptown. It served Harlem – kids from Harlem and Bed-Stuy. And so what, what about these schools and what was going on? Well, I mean – in the simplest sense, Micken, this character that you're bringing up, what Micken sees is what anybody can see when you walk into a school is you see dysfunction when it's such a system as, as the New York City Board of Education. Now, on, on one level, we got to take it easy on people, right? It's a big system. There's always going to be cracks and holes and we, we, we got to have love. But but the system itself is just it's personless. It's the point of it. It's it's why there's multiple choice exams. It's so the teacher can grade stuff faster. Everybody knows that, right? I hope they don't think it's because it makes for a good exam. It's like a joke, right? Like it's so the teacher can work faster and get more done so the administrator can demonstrate excellence so that the administrator can continue to administrate a school. Well, everybody knows this. If you don't know that, you're fooling yourself, okay? And Micken won't be fooled because Micken isn't a fool. He's smart. He's like a wonderkind, you know, he's this guy who's got it figured out. And I personally think he does. He has, what he has figured out is how the system works, how it fails kids. And I actually think he knows what, what it needs to get better. The problem is, is he's all in his head. He's entirely in his head. And so that type of living, living in your head, what it does, and this is, this goes a little bit to our work at First Things Foundation too. When you have a really good idea, and Nick, if you have a really good idea, usually you can tell. Like if you share it with your friends, you go, that's a really good idea. This is what I've learned partly in reading, uh, writing the book, but also in just in life. Who gives that crap? <laughs> Thanks for a good idea. It's just an idea. 
It's just living in your head. It's really not reality. And what Micken does is he takes all of his ideas in his head and then he meets this guy, Taut Tower. And Taut Tower becomes his spiritual father, for lack of... It's not lack of a better word. I like that word because it makes perfect sense. He, Taut Tower, leads Micken down a road that says, we can fix everyone's problem. So these are ideologues, right? And these are, at their core, utopian people. Now, this is where it, I think it ties into today. If, if and Just interrupt me if I get too long. But guys, we live in a society filled with utopian thinkers. And you know how you know you're a utopian? When you wake up and you say, you know what's going to happen today? I'm going to make the world a better place. No, you are not. <laughs> today, you might make you a better person for just a moment in time. And hopefully someone sees that and they also consider goodness. But the world itself, and this is where history comes in. And we can actually, we can battle on this if you guys want to. History tells us the world remains the same. Well, well, John, I want to, I think this is really interesting. <laughs> First, that, that when I talk about my experience in Sierra Leone, for our listeners who haven't connected the dots yet, it was, yeah, it was yeah. my experience working for you in Sierra Leone, right? Um, and I think when I first, when, when most people first get off the plane and, and land in a culture like that, especially, you know, if you're from a developed country and you have a, you know, a four-year degree and an education that has a gold stamp on it. Um, after you get over like the initial shock of like, I want to go home, then the next kind of thought is, how can I fix this place, right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It's how many, how like, what can we do that's the most efficient to feed the most amount of poor kids that are like around me, right? In Sierra Leone, that's, that was my first thought. It's like, well, how can we, how can we, how can we create the best system here to help the most amount of people? And I think at first I rebelled against the idea that, well, maybe the reality is, yeah, maybe you can feed some, some kids here, but it's really not going to change too much. And there was a great documentary that came out not too long mm -hmm. ago called Poverty Inc. that really shows that it doesn't, it doesn't actually change too much. It's a good show. I'm really good. But, but what, I, what I heard you say, and, and I think there is a quote that kind of goes, goes along with this, is the idea that... Maybe you can change a culture or society, but but really the first place you need to look is at yourself, yeah, right? You need to yeah. ch you need to change you need to change yourself, and I think this is what you're getting at with this this book. But it's so countercultural. I mean, what would you say to people that are like, how could I not, you know, like we talk about this a lot? How could I not just like give money to the poor or like want to you know want to create that school or yes. hospital? You deal with this every day at mm -hmm. First Things Foundation. You you literally have to think about this question all the time. You talk about it philosophically in the book, but how do you how do you connect the dots there for f folks who are thinking, no, 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 I just, I want to help. So the cool thing is, Austin, it's a great question. Anybody who says I want to help is doing great work. <laughs> so this is great. This is fantastic. This is how, this is how the conscience works. It starts with, who am I to sit on this and not give this? Let me... Add my hands, my feet, my money, my time. This is great. Number one, great. But it's great because if you take the next step, it will serve you. Now, he, people hear that as selfish. But I really think it's a traditional Christian understanding that the reason Christ is saying to give is so that you might be rid of your obesity. And I use that word on purpose because we're in a very unique society, the fattest society of all times. And it's not by chance. It's it, The symbolism is not just a luck up. When we try to hold on to the things that we think will make us happy, we become obese, both in spirit and body, right? It's in letting them go that you actually acquire the joy and the love. And so why should people give? They should give because they need to for their spiritual health. Now, stop. That still means the money goes somewhere, Austin. <laughs> it still has to go out the door or the time has to go somewhere. And that's where I think the key is, is the people who administer that keep in mind what they're doing. They are also in the search to try to serve their soul. And if they do it right again and again, what will happen is, is by nature, service of their soul looks like giving 
fully to others. It's just what the physics look like. It's the spiritual physics of the thing. And, and what happens is, is if you think about now, I don't want to run down an industry, but I'm very much deeply involved in the aid industry. Like I get how this works, USAID, USAID. And I know this world. And if you really think about where everyone thinks all the, the, the really important change comes from, they think it's in the plans made by the planners. They really think if you just construct the right plan, you'll change lives. And here's what I want to say to that. You will. But notice that's not that's not that's not a value question you will change lives but is it for the better and now in order to answer that question you have to have moral clarity which means you have to have gone into yourself see this is what's so cool in order for you to know whether it's good change or bad change you have to clarify wipe clean the 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 lenses which are your own noose because you will not just because someone turned up looking like you i.e africa and western aid just because they start to look like us and have a couch does not mean they've become better it only means they became like us and that's just classic narcissism that doesn't mean they became better you have to know them which means you have to clearly know yourself and that's what we're trying to do but here's the cool thing to tie it into the book that's what Raphael is trying to do she's not bringing people into her house and starting a crazy homeless shelter for them it's for her now you ask yourself that feels selfish it's a different conversation it's an interesting one right because you're field workers john you would love to see the places that they work get better off as you just said sure why not? but first and foremost you'd, you'd like to see the people that you've hired and you've invested in change themselves it's it is somewhat selfish a little bit but it's like it, it, i'm i'm fine use that word if you want we want you to yeah to 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 be different and see the world differently and, and shed yourself over these two years that you're you're giving away well, do this with me for two seconds guys i won't i won't i won't stretch this out too long let's just let's just call this person steve and steve is gung-ho he's excited man he wants to go to africa to reduce the birth rate so that people are born into smaller villages so there's more chance for for for, for wealth right you don't have to spread it around these are all by the way they're, they're mathematically not wrong ideas right and so he's doing a birth control program and the birth control program is going well women are starting to take just just go on that just go with that with me and now i call up steve tell me about how your program's going what do the women think oh they love it are we sure they love it are we sure that, that you love that they're doing what you're saying how can i trust steve to know or is he just implementing a policy what i really want to know is about the women i don't want to know about steve's philosophy I want to know about them. Can he actually ask them with clarity about what's really happening in their life if he has a plan for them? I don't think he can. I just don't think he can. So just to end that, we had a, we had a project in Guatemala that was going direction A, and it was awesome. And then it went direction B. And the reason it went direction B, which was into the ground, is because the guy who – the local person who was running the project, he didn't want to do it anymore. He's like, guys, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to stay home with my family. Okay, great. <laughs> why would we Why would we want to put a new guy in his project? Like, it, it seems odd to me. It seems very arrogant. Right. So. And so, yeah. John, as an educator, you've seen this self-esteem movement kind of mm. take education by force. Now, does the self-esteem movement fly in the face of what you're trying to do? Like if you took like your, your prototypical public school educated kid, you know, how would they do in your sort of first things environment? What is, what is the public school system doing mm. that's different than yours? Is there something wrong with this self-esteem movement? Cause that seems to be very different <laughs> than what you're describing. <laughs> you know what I'll do? I'll send you guys a link. I use this as a teacher. It's just a beautiful, simple, I think it's German. Just this little little twenty minute documentary, and it shows these kids coloring butterflies. Have you guys seen this? No. I'll I'll try to find it and send it to you. <laughs> millions of views on YouTube. Yeah, millions. It shows them coloring butterflies, <laughs> and they get a trophy. And the teacher 
a teacher is walking around and telling him, that is amazing. That's the best butterfly I've ever seen, which is pretty much like every teacher has ever said. Then they show the way they do it at this school in Germany or wherever it was. I think it's Germany. It could have been France. And they're instructed to never say anything about the greatness of the picture ever. Mm. They're instructed to say this. Tell me about why this is gold and why this is green. Tell me about why you were outside of the lines here and why you weren't in. Which is better? Why? They never say anything about the quality of the work. Ever. And what happens is the kids turn out fine. <laughs> because here's the premise of the, of the non-self-esteem education, which is honesty and truth. Because it's not the best butterfly you ever saw. And so what happens at first things is, is I, mean, I mean, I could tie it into the book too, but guys, none of us are going to be the best person that ever was. I don't know how to explain it to you. That already happened. I mean, in my tradition, there's only one of those. One is holy, one is good. So there's one. Everybody else is a mess. And so at first things, we try to start with the mess. Tell me about your mess. One of the things we had someone interview, and I, I love this person, and I hope to hire her, but she was telling me about how great she was. And by the way, everybody does that in an interview. Yeah. And then we said, well, tell, tell me about how your what's your mess? That, that, that is the toughest question. <laughs> and no one wants to answer that question. We got to answer it. It's so refreshing. It's so wonderful. And so what, but just to finish that thought, and Austin, you can probably speak on this. <laughs> Once you get plopped down in a foreign culture, culture and, and we do our work in Appalachia too. And for most Americans who join it for first things, that's also pretty foreign. But uh, whenever you plop down somewhere for long term, not for a week, not for a weekend for sure. But if you're going to do two years, all your mess gets exposed. Get ready. It's coming out. You're just sh- stripped again like the book and the character we talked about Raffaella, you're stripped it's super unpleasant but when you get it and get through it and start to emerge from it it's really gorgeous so yeah i think self-esteem is dangerous man maybe to tie this all together i think what i hear you saying and and from the themes of the book it's it's this idea that in order to gain moral clarity you need a sort of aestheticism that helps Mm -hmm. you peel back to scrape away Mm -hmm. the mess that you have. And through that kind of moral clarity and through that scraping away and through that community, you know, living in a different country with someone else, kind of Mm -hmm. obeying their rules, not, not your own, you're starting to then see with new eyes, right? You're starting to kind of have a sort of rebirth to be able to then listen with new ears and do projects and things that, that makes sense in that community and makes sense in that culture that also align with, you know, what we would call in the Christian community, right. the logos, the truth. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and it sounds like through the, throughout the book, that's, that's kind of the, you're, what you're hitting at is all these different angles. You're getting the aesthetic mm-hmm. angle in there. You're getting the kind of the need for, for more clarity, but then you're talking about how we get, we get in a mess when we go too far on the side of the passions or too far on the side of the, mm-hmm. too far on mm-hmm. the side of reason. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, you know, is and what would you? I mean, you 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 talk about self esteem, but would you also say that we're kind of in a paradox here, where where we have the the passions too much, but we also have like it seems like the reason part of American culture is is pretty maybe skewed at sometimes too. Like it seems like we're kind of living in both. What do you think? Yeah, again, that's uh, one of the themes that I love, uh, both on our own podcast in our work, but also in the book. So in the book, the construct is you have these three people living in an apartment complex, one on the bottom, one in the middle, one on the top, right? And uh, eventually over time, what you see is is that the mind can get you in as much trouble as, as the belly. And uh, I think for me anyway, my temptation is mind. I love a good argument. I used to think that a good argument would convince people to do stuff. I, I think what it might do is get people to become curious, but I don't know that good arguments do that. Um, uh, and I think what, what we've done in America is rewarded the mind. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not a terrible thing. Uh, but our school system was built by uh, Rockefeller and Carnegie and the big industrialists. It was built right to reward productivity. And those who are most productive right, are those who administer and make the products. And so, again, there's nothing 
inherently wrong with that, but that's been the success, the success model. That's been the, the way we get things done in America and the way we reward people. You can just see it in salary structures. And so bad or good, I don't know, but I know one thing is you can become top heavy in a culture, top heavy or rat reason heavy, right? Uh, technology heavy, uh, they, they they inevitably ignore two things. One is the beauty of the belly. And I mean that. There's beauty in the passions. But they also scoot right over the heart. And I don't know many people. Do you guys know people who think that the heart is anything but a, a, a pulsating muscle? In, in our tradition, no, no. It's actually the seat. I was talking to my, uh, I do uh, acupuncture with a guy I love. He's a Chinese medicine guy. And he was saying in Chinese medicine tradition, listen to this, guys. This is fascinating. That the heart is not actually in the body. It resides in the consciousness of the gods, mm. so to speak. And that it is actually just a pounding muscle, but that you are tied into this greater consciousness. That's the Chinese medicine model. So when they go to treat the heart, they actually treat the, your, your spirit. Mm. It's pretty interesting, right? Yeah, that's that's wild. That is not not Western medicine for you. No, no, I know, and it throws everybody off. And I, I get why people go, "Oh gosh, this is getting weird." It's not that weird. I'll just here's why it's not that weird, Nick. And I don't, I know we're probably hitting toward the end, but you know why it's not that weird? Because every Christian for the last two thousand years has said something like, "Man, woman are made in God's image." Now, take that, just play that out, guys. Just just play it out. What it means is divinity resides in you. Whoa, 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 whoa. It means you are divine. Mm -hmm. You have that within you. Yet, if we took just, if we just took slices of Austin's life in the last 48 hours, I mean, do we see it? Do you see it in mine? You see elements of it. So what's the implication? The implication is, is you can show more of it. You can become more of it. You can actually become fully, whoa, watch this, fully divine. Whoa. You become fully the image you were meant to be. Now, here's the question. Can you? And I think the answer for a Christian has to be, yeah, 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 you can. Yes. Yes. Otherwise, this doesn't make any sense. I'm just destined for the for the bin of, of hell. No, you can do it but only with God's help. Yeah, yeah, we can get into theology. But the point I'm trying to say is, is that's not that far away from that Chinese idea that you actually, yeah, you are a part of something divine, like literally a part. So for our listeners, maybe they're like, oh, I'm definitely a head person. I'm just head in the clouds. I'm thinking about ideas. I'm, or I'm hyper analytical or whatnot. Or maybe you have someone who's like, I, I, I get too invested in my work or in play or in, whatever those passions yeah. and and they know where they want to be and they want to like take themselves out of this matrix that they know that they're trapped in like mm -hmm. what is the first step how do you start to activate more of that heart that seems to reside yeah. outside as you described it earlier can i use Raffaella? Yeah, please because i think i'm trying to address that what she does is puts herself into obedience. Um, in the Orthodox tradition, she gets a spiritual father, a confessor. I think Catholics have called that traditionally a confessor. And it's uncomfortable, especially for her boyfriend, David, because he's like, what is this, a cult? Yeah, he's not too happy about There's it. There's some... No, he's not. <laughs> Very few people would be, I think, in 2020. What Rafaela does... Is takes her very wild and very, very smart and very, very potentially successful self and puts it under the obedience of a Greek monk who could care less about success in the world. And I don't know who that what that would be to you guys, to anyone listening, to anyone who listens to Watar. I, I mean, I have an idea in my own tradition, but obedience works. And all you got to do is look at athletes michael jordan you really think he's who he is if he's not in obedience to something else it's crazy to imagine that he did that on his own there's nobody that can do that it's never happened it's never happened in any kind of story we might call success obedience is essential it's also one of the most outdated forgotten virtues in our world and we're in a cycle right now where obedience you might as well just say like i don't know 
like molestation, being obedient to somebody is really awful. Like it seems odd. Um, I don't like it myself. I'm not trying to say, hey, yeah, I can't wait to go talk to my spiritual father and you can tell me to not do things that I love. That's not, I don't, nobody likes it, but man, how can you not be reminded from time to time that you're not your own master? Isn't that important? Or, or is it? Is it? Is it for fear that you won't be able to do the things? You know, imagine if Michael Jordan was your coach. Oh, gosh. Yeah, I'm doing whatever he tells me You've, to do. I'm going to be like Mike. I know. He earned it, yeah. right? And that's the same concept with a spiritual father. And in the book, Raffaella is willing to do it. And as she does it, she goes closer and closer to what I would call that, you know, that clarity. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, what if you get a bad one? Spiritual father. Right. What if it goes off the rails? What if the person uh, doesn't have your best interest in mind? I get all that. It's really important. But I, I would say obedience is, is an essential part of that process to wh whatever you're trying to do. But in the spiritual life, I think so. I think the second thing is to, to, to remember your death. I tell my students, I used to tell them this, guys, in this class I taught, The History of Love. I really love that class. It was a great class, and I'm thankful for it. Seacrest Country Day School, shout out. Um, in that class, I used to tell them, you know what's going to happen about 200 years after your death? <laughs> no one on the earth will remember who you were. How do they respond to that? Are they, do they like beg to differ? That's a, that number one, I beg to differ. They hate to yeah. hear that. Then the second thing they say is, well, and they try to do their timeline and they say, what about Ben Franklin? I'm like, you're right. We do <laughs> remember his name. I was wrong. I always play this. I know what's coming. I was wrong. I was wrong. Name five others from before 200 years ago. It's over real fast. They, uh, they, it, it dies fast. And I go, and now name how many people lived since 200 years ago. You've named four people out of 18 billion people. Yeah, maybe you're the one. Maybe you're one of the four. Okay. <laughs> I don't think so. If that's how you want to live your life, is meaning the four people that can be remembered after 200 years, uh, go for it. Just remember your death. It's coming and it, it humbles you. And I think it makes you much better at the spiritual life. It's great. Austin, do you have any other, other questions? Austin's like, I'm going to be one. I'm going to go sleep well, in my coffin I'll now. Just, yeah, that's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. All right Austin's right. like, I think I could be one of the four. I think I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, I think I already am, but no, uh, I, I think one thing again, just to tie this back to to the work you're doing, John, is in the in the second point you made there. Re remember your death. It's so hard to do that in in, in where we are mm -hmm. and the time we're in, and and to some extent, that's a good thing. Like you know, we're not all just dying all the time, but in these countries that you're working in, and, and you're and you have people working in, it's it's less hard to <laughs> to consider those things and. It's true, man. That's and, true. And to some extent, yeah, the culture you're in, I think it's it can never be overstated. The culture you're in has yes. a, a yes. tremendous influence yes. on you. And um, you have to be wary of that. Like, what is the culture around me changing in my heart? Like, it, you know, who am I taking obedience from? Or who am I taking? Who is my authority figures? Is it no one? Mm -hmm. Is it is it the wrong people? And then you're saying, you know, how am I thinking about death and things like that? And and I, I think those are, like you said, those are good points to reflect. But maybe if someone wants to learn more about that, they, they need to actually read the book and, and see how the characters, you know, dealt with those those questions themselves. I would love for people to read the book. Where can where can people find it? So right now it's on Amazon. Uh, you can get it. Here's a cool way to get it. If you're a Kindle person, you just come through our website, First Things Foundation, first-things.org. Uh, sign up. Uh, for our uh, newsletter, which is a pretty cool news. It's a heady newsletter. We get a lot of cool stuff from the from the field. Uh, Austin right here wrote some great stuff. Uh, and it talks about our work, but really it talks about life. And then you get the book for free on Kindle if you join our website today. Uh, the other way to get it is we are starting something called a pod course. 
Uh, the pod course will talk about the kind of things we talk about on Watar. That's our podcast. And if you join the pod course, you'll also get the book for free. So, but Amazon's a way to go. Three, the number, souls, and you go to Amazon, it pops up, John Hears, and you can order it. It's a little, it's a little pricey. It's not bad though. 14 bucks. And what's the, what's the website URL where you go for uh, the download? It's www.first, like F-I-R-S-T, first-things.org. And we'll, uh, we'll put it in the show notes as well. Yeah, guys. You know, our book release, uh, it was, it's choppy. We're small. We're trying to do our best. Uh, you guys were real kind uh, to have me come on and talk as an author. I got to tell you, it was awesome. Yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure, John. Uh, we'd love to have you on again, and maybe we could talk a little bit more about your work. And gosh, you got so many ideas. And I, I, I recommend all of our listeners to hop on John's podcast, Watar, Why Are We Talking About Rabbits? A lot of similar themes, and he just goes into all the mm-hmm. philosophy behind you know where we're at today. So check him out. Smart guy. You'll learn a lot. And Can I say something about you guys? Yeah, let's go. So this is about their podcast. It's about them, too. You got to realize these are revolutionary dudes. In 2020, when people are talking about the things they're talking about and the kind of educational ideas they have, what that used to be, you know, 150 years ago, the stuff they talk about and the way they talk about life, that was like, okay, man, you're just like your dad. Not anymore. <laughs> this is radical stuff. Everything's going to look not like this. And what I like about their podcast is they say the truth about simplicity and what it means to, I think, really live a wholesome life. I love your work. Thank you, guys. And thanks for having me on. And uh, we're not done. We're going to see each other again soon, God willing. John, thanks for the kind words. Final question for you. When's the, ne- when's the next book come out? So you want to hear this is true? I have it probably 60% written. It's about, there's, in two seconds, there is a man living in Ethiopia, right? He's living in uh, the 1600s, and he is an Orthodox Christian, and he is taken through a whole series of events into slavery by a Portuguese ship that goes uh, and basically breaks down in Barbados and he's sold into America as an African slave, but he's very aware of his Christianity and it's an interesting story and I need to finish it and publish it. Mm. It's a novel about a slave from Ethiopia in America saying, what the heck is going on here? Well, keep us updated. Yeah. Yeah. We'll break it down when it's out. Cool. And uh, thanks so much for being here. And for our listeners, we will see you next week. And as John likes to say, peace out. Peace out. Well, that was a lot of stuff going on. Check out those guys and their podcast. They're out in Seattle. Check out their work. Support them. And keep coming back here where we say to you, Shenny's Gaggy Marjo. So that means to you the victory. It's often said at the KP table in the Georgian Republic. That's our pod for today. Thanks for coming along. Water is produced by Andrew Schwark, Daniel Paternos, and in this case, by the lovely guys out in Eden. Eden Revisited. The whole thing is sponsored by First Things Foundation. We're a nonprofit that lives and works in some of the toughest neighborhoods in the world. We try really hard to help local people brilliant people build their vision of a better life. We listen and then move resources toward their best projects. Share Watar with friends. Hit us up with solid reviews on iTunes and everywhere you get your podcasts. Your love for us allows us to serve others. Hasta luego, come bufo. How do you say it in a, a Latin way? Bye-bye. Bye-bye us. That's what we're saying. Bye-bye us. Peace out.